Chemistry lecture number 63, changes of state. The physical state of a substance can be changed by increasing or decreasing its temperature. For example, a solid substance can be converted into a liquid by heating a solid. Throw some ice into a hot frying pan and the ice will turn into water. Uh, heat a chunk of wax and the wax will melt and turn into a clear liquid. When a solid is heated, energy is added to its atoms or molecules. Uh, the particles begin to vibrate faster and faster. The kinetic energy of the particles increases. When the uh, average kinetic energy or temperature is high enough, particles begin to slip past each other and no longer have an orderly crystallized arrangement. At this temperature, the solid begins to turn into a liquid. This temperature is called the melting point. So here we have a picture of a orderly solid, and then if you add heat or increase the uh, temperature, uh, the molecules uh, start vibrating, and then they move fast enough to uh, start sliding past each other. And then when that occurs, when there's enough space that the uh, molecules can start sliding past each other, uh, you have liquid. So that's how you turn a solid into a liquid. It's also possible for a liquid to be converted into a solid. If water or liquid wax is cooled, heat or energy is removed from the liquid. The molecules move more slowly. They eventually move slowly enough to allow bonds to form between molecules. Groups of molecules bonded together grow larger and become visible crystals. And the temperature at which solid crystals appear is called the freezing point. The freezing point is the temperature at which a liquid can turn into a solid. The freezing point and melting point of uh, a substance is the same. Uh, H2O can either melt at zero degrees Celsius or freeze. If heat is added, it will melt. If heat is removed, it will freeze. The freezing or melting point of a substance is a transition zone where both solid and liquid can exist. And the direction of transition depends on whether energy is added or removed. A solid can also be converted into a gas. And this occurs when molecules on the surface of a solid leave the surface and go directly into the surrounding atmosphere. When a solid is converted directly into a gas, the process is called sublimation. So here we have a solid where all the molecules are in an orderly uh, crystal lattice. And if you add heat, uh, suddenly the particles on the surface will go directly into the air. So that's what happens in sublimation. A solid gets converted directly into a gas. Dry ice, solid carbon dioxide, uh, does not melt into a liquid. It sublimes into CO2 gas. Iodine crystals also sublimate directly into iodine gas. Mothballs and air fresheners are also solid substances that turn directly into gases. So here's a picture of uh, dry ice. So notice the sort of the steam-like looking stuff coming off of it. So this is carbon dioxide gas coming directly off the solid carbon dioxide. So this is sublimation, a solid turning directly into a uh, gas. Here's another picture. Uh, these are iodine crystals. Now on the bottom right here are the solid iodine crystals. The solid iodine crystals evaporate and turn into a gas. And what happens is the gas redeposits itself underneath the uh, evaporating dish here and becomes a solid again. And sometimes you see this in your uh, freezer when the lid underneath the, the underside of a lid of a container in your freezer has ice crystals underneath it. Well, that's because the ice crystals evaporate uh, directly into a gas and they redeposit themselves as solid. So there's no liquid in here. It just goes directly from solid into gas and then the gas redeposits itself as a solid. Freeze-dried foods are made through the sublimation process. To freeze a sample of uh, food, or to freeze-dry a sample of food, such as ice cream, uh, you first freeze the food so that the water in the food becomes solid ice. Next, you remove the air molecules surrounding the food, and this reduces the surrounding atmospheric pressure and causes the ice in the food to evaporate. The food now has no H2O. It's been dried out. And let's see, here's an example of uh, freeze-dried food. So this is astronaut uh, ice cream. And so these uh, chunks, this used to be ice cream, but it was frozen to solidify all the uh, water. And then 
you put it in a vacuum, which means that you take away all the surrounding atmospheric uh, pressure, so there's no gas molecules surrounding it, and this is causes the uh, ice inside to evaporate, and then all the water has been removed. So it's kind of like a hard, dry cookie. Kind of tastes chalky too. Okay. Solids can become gases through sublimation, and liquids can become gases through evaporation. In a liquid, the atoms or molecules are still attracted to each other with enough force to pull them together. However, the particles have enough kinetic energy to move and slide past each other. If a particle on the surface of a liquid has enough kinetic energy, it can overcome the intramolecular forces of attraction, leave the surface of the liquid, and go into the atmosphere as a gas. And this is the process of evaporation. So, you just have molecules on the surface, and then when the molecules on the surface go into the air, it's evaporation. A vapor is the gaseous state of a substance that is normally a liquid or solid at room temperature. Thus, steam is a vapor because H2O is normally a liquid at room temperature. So that's what the definition of a vapor is, something that's normally uh, a liquid or solid at room temperature that's been turned into a gas. If a container of water is left out in the sun, the water would eventually evaporate into the atmosphere. If the top of the container were covered, the water would still evaporate, but the vapor would be trapped above the liquid. So, if you have a container and you have it filled with liquid and then it evaporates and there's no lid well the molecules would just go out into the air but if you put a lid on top and it goes into the air the molecules become trapped the lid doesn't let it escape Now, as water continues to evaporate, there would be a lot of vapor trapped above the liquid. And eventually, there wouldn't be enough space above the liquid to hold all the H2O molecules. At this point, the surface above the liquid would be saturated with vapor. Some of the vapor molecules would go back into the liquid. Even though vapor molecules are returning to the liquid, there are still molecules that are leaving the liquid and hovering above the surface. Eventually, the rate at which molecules leave the liquid will be equal to the rate at which the molecules return to the liquid. There will be no net change in the amount of liquid or vapor. Equilibrium has been reached. So even though the amount of liquid and vapor remains constant, the molecules are still moving back and forth between the vapor and the liquid. The system is dynamic. Thus, the vapor and the liquid are in dynamic equilibrium. There's constant movement, but no net change. So, here's dynamic equilibrium. When you put the lid over the uh, water, the liquid, it starts to evaporate, and then eventually uh, there'll be enough water vapor above the surface, and this gets saturated, and pretty soon there's not enough room for all the uh, vapor that wants to evaporate. So what happens is some of the molecules will return to the liquid, and while they're returning, other molecules are going back into the uh, vapor, and the rate at which the molecules go back equals the rate at which it goes back up. So, the amount of vapor above stays constant, the amount of liquid stays constant, so it's an equilibrium, but since there's this constant movement, it's dynamic equilibrium. The vapor above the liquid exerts a vapor pressure. If the liquid has a low vapor pressure, the, intramole the intramolecular forces are strong and the molecules like to stick together and don't evaporate easily. So if there's strong intramolecular forces, they stick together, evaporation does not occur very easily. If the liquid has a high vapor pressure, the intramolecular forces uh, are weak. The molecules do not stick together and they evaporate easily. So, we have two liquids. One liquid doesn't evaporate very much and the other evaporates quite a bit. So the one that doesn't evaporate very much is going to have low vapor pressure, which is just another way of saying there are going to be very few vapor molecules. And if there's low vapor pressure, it means there's strong intramolecular forces where the uh, molecules want to stick together. That's why it doesn't evaporate easily. On the other hand, right here, the molecules in this liquid have weak intramolecular forces. They don't like to stick together, so they can move apart uh, from each other very easily. And there'll be lots of vapor, so there'll be high vapor pressure. 
If the container of a liquid is exposed to the atmosphere and heated continuously, it begins to boil. Boiling occurs when the vapor pressure exerted by the liquid equals the atmospheric pressure above the liquid. So, when boiling occurs, you have a vapor pressure developing, and then the atmospheric pressure, which is just caused by, you know, atoms and molecules in the uh, atmosphere, push down on the surface of the uh, liquid. Well, when the vapor pressure coming off the liquid equals the atmospheric pressure pushing down on it, that's when boiling occurs. So you can have evaporation without boiling, but the moment that uh, evaporation occurs so much that the vapor pressure coming off equals the pressure pushing down, that's when boiling occurs. High atmospheric pressure interferes with the boiling process and the liquid needs a higher temperature before boiling can occur. At lower atmospheric pressures, which occurs at the top of a mountain, uh, boiling occurs more easily and the liquid will boil at a lower temperature. The temperature at which a liquid boils is the boiling point. Most of the time we use the boiling point that occurs at normal atmospheric pressure, which is 101.325 kilopascals. This, normal boil, uh, this particular boiling point is called the normal boiling point. So, um, at the top of a mountain, it's, uh, the pressure is lower, and so since there's less air pressure uh, pushing down, uh, it boils more easily at the top of a mountain. So, it boils at a lower temperature. A liquid that boils and evaporates easily is volatile. Volatile liquids exert high vapor pressure, have low boiling points, and have weak intermolecular forces. Non-volatile substances do not evaporate easily, have high boiling points, and have strong intermolecular forces. So, here's a previous picture. This one would be a volatile uh, liquid because it evaporates easily and it would boil more easily um, and it has weak intermolecular forces. This one would be non-volatile. It doesn't evaporate easily and has stronger intermolecular forces. Right? And it would have a higher boiling point too. It would take more energy to get the uh, things to separate. This would have a lower boiling point since it evaporates uh, very easily. Okay, so <clears throat> quick review. Uh, liquid that boils and evaporates easily is volatile. So that's volatile. Non-volatile substances do not evaporate easily. That's the non-volatile one. At its boiling point, a substance can exist as either a liquid or a gas. If energy is added to the boiling point, if energy is added at the boiling point, a liquid will be converted into gas. If energy is removed at the boiling point, gas will condense into a liquid. So, a lot of information about change of state. For a PDF transcript of this lecture, go to www.richardlouis.com. This has been chemistry lecture number 63, Changes of State.